start the recording. Perfect. Welcome everyone. My name is Deborah Gallant. I am uh, your facilitator for today, though I am absolutely not your subject matter expert, which is why I brought other people in who know much better about this stuff than I do. I am the executive director of e for all in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, and I am the person within the e for all family who runs a monthly deep dive. I like to say that while I think we help you a lot in the intensive part of your e for all business accelerator, I think there's a lot of stuff you don't get to learn. And that's what I try to put together every month um, in terms of creating topics that you guys can learn from. At every single e for all event that I run, I thank our sponsors because all e for all programs are completely free of charge. We're a nonprofit and it's thanks to these generous donors. If any of you found us by happenstance or someone told you about it and you're not sure what E4ALL is, I'd like to make sure everyone knows. E4ALL is all about empowering people to start their own businesses. These are our statistics across all of our sites. 700 businesses with over $43 million in revenue in 2020, and 70% of the businesses are still active after three years. So that's pretty impressive. Um, we did just run a pitch contest here in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. We have an accelerator coming up, but if you're in any of our e for all communities, we do these on a regular basis and you can find out about them on our e for all website. These deep dive programs are every month. They're always on a Monday afternoon from four to 5.30 Eastern time. And yes, I know we have sites who are not in Eastern time anymore. So I have to make sure I say that. Um, it's usually the second or the third, although we are taking a break in December. Um, the next one that we'll be back with is on January 24th. We have a Google expert talking about making better decisions with Google Analytics. So um, when I've said that to people, they go, what is Google Analytics? If you're asking that question, you are in the right audience for a deep dive webinar. It's the stuff that tells you how your website is performing. Um, and they're gonna have a really great uh, Google presenter for us on January 24th. February 28th, why your business needs a brand. We always hear that people need marketing help. And on March 21st, I just lined up a speaker who's an expert on email marketing because it is still a fantastic marketing method and a loyalty builder. So we think that's really important. And we have lots more coming up in April. I think I'm gonna be doing one on food businesses. And if these sound interesting to you, there are about 15 of them that we've done since we launched in uh, 2020 and they are all archived at eforall.org. So the format for today is we're gonna have a presentation by our two guest presenters, Anya and Barb from Forge. Um, I love the Forge uh, mission statement here on a mission to help innovators navigate the journey from physical prototype to commercialization and impact at scale. That sounds so scary, but I know you guys bring it down to the nuts and bolts. Honestly, if you make a product, this is all the stuff you need to know. And the Forge folks came to an e for all program staff meeting, I don't know, maybe six months ago. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I did not know that this resource exists. So I circled right up with Laura, your, your uh, executive director and said, we have to have you guys come and do a deep dive. So I'm delighted to, to finally be making that happen. So what we do is we will have the presentation and Anya will drive her uh, deck. Um, you can ask questions as we go along. You can type in the chat, you can raise your hand. We want this to be a problem solving, informative session for everybody. Um, but what we do after the first hour is when the presentation is over, we stop recording. And that's when you get a chance to literally have a free for all and ask your questions and say, like, I know AJ's on the call. You might want to say, did you ever help anybody make shoes? And then you can tell them what you know about making shoes. So I know there's lots of people with different businesses and um, they'll want to ask their specific questions and ask for examples and some specific help. And that's what the last half hour is all for. And we sometimes have some great discussions, not just between the e for all the presenter people and the audience, but among the audience members themselves, because you guys are all from different e for all So I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna welcome Anya and Barb to be our presenters. I think Anya is gonna drive 
And I'm gonna mute myself unless I have something I have to say, but there you go. Welcome to E4L's Deep Dive. Awesome, thank you so much, Deborah. I'm just gonna get my screen oriented here. I've got lots of monitors going as everyone should in the Zoom world, but yeah, thanks so much for the warm welcome. Um, maybe Barb and I can just take a minute to introduce ourselves and a little bit about our background. Um, so my name is Anya Losek and I am the Senior Program Manager at Forge, which means in my role, I'm really the primary startup facing member of our team. If any of you choose to connect with us after this presentation, I'll be the one kind of carrying out a one-to-one -one with you, doing the onboarding process with you. And I really do spend most of my time on calls with CEOs and co-founders just talking about what they're working on, uh, what their product development challenges are and how Forge can help. I, in the past, worked at a startup myself, so I know kind of all the pain points that you guys are struggling with and um, all the aspirations that you have. So I think it's a really exciting area to be in. And I'll hand it over to Forge if you want to give, oh, Forge, Barb, if you want to give an introduction to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'll just do a really quick, please, uh, a quick introduction. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, so I am in one of our uh, main regions that's actually in the northeast part of uh, Massachusetts. And we'll tell you why I'm here today instead of uh, Kevin Maforte, who's actually the person that's in your region. Kevin uh, just went off and had a pair of twins. So uh, we all cover each other. I know, Kevin, yay. Uh, so we all cover each other. Um, I have a background in manufacturing. I've started seven companies and a couple of them were products that had to get manufactured. So I've been in, in uh, you know, that space for a long time. I'm sure that people can surprise me with things that they're trying to do, but uh, hopefully I have a deep enough background to at least help you get to step one or two. And uh, that's probably enough. So I'm going to take it away. Awesome. Great. Well, yeah, I'll just kick it off and I'll ask if anyone in the audience has heard of Forge before. Hands, chat if you have. And if not, that's great. <laughs> Barb has. Awesome. <laughs> Cool. Well, we have a lot of time to dive into exactly what we're working on and we're excited. So, and it sounds like you have some awesome other deep dive topics going on too. I'll have to make time to come to the Google Analytics one because that's something we're working on also. But yeah, who here is working on making a physical product or hopes to develop a physical product in the future? Hands. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, like Deborah mentioned, we are Forge, and you might be wondering, who are we? What do we do? So Forge is on a mission to help startups navigate the journey from prototype through to commercialization and impact at scale. And our team is really uniquely positioned to help entrepreneurs like you as a result of our curated supply chain network, our team expertise, and our years of data. And similar to e for all as a nonprofit organization, it'll never cost you anything to work with us. So I know that's super important to say upfront and it's a question that we get all the time. People are always wondering, what's the catch? You know, what's the string attached? But I'll just repeat myself, never cost you anything to work with Forge, no equity, nothing like that. We're really just here to kind of be supporters in the ecosystem, just like e for all So we're excited we can partner with awesome organizations like e for all and kind of get the word out there about Forge and why you should be thinking about manufacturing and supply chain, especially when you're developing a physical product. Because as some of you may have experienced, it's a totally different ball game to be developing a physical product as opposed to a software or a service. There's just totally different considerations financially, timeline-wise, just all across the board. So we're really here to help entrepreneurs that are taking that journey maybe for the very first time in what they need to think about, things they need to consider. So yeah, I'll keep on rolling. So at our core, really, we work with startups and entrepreneurs to help them prepare to manufacture and to so source your supply chain locally and regionally. So we help entrepreneurs at a wide variety of stages, starting from an initial prototype of what they're trying to make through to full commercialization and manufacturing maturity. Um, and we do this through really understanding what you need and really providing curated training and resources and connections to right fit regional manufacturers and suppliers. So some of the support that you might want to be thinking about when you're in your product development journey and some of the support that we can you know, refer you to when the time comes are design firms, initial prototyping, parts and fabrication of parts and components, production at volume, manufacturing at scale, third-party logistics and packaging. So we're gonna talk all, 
about all of these in a little more detail later on in the presentation, but just kind of a taste of what's out there in the physical product development world, in the manufacturing world. So yeah, any questions up till now? I'm not keeping an eye on the chat, so feel free to interrupt me if anything comes up, but awesome. So you might be saying, why does Forge exist? Why do you do what you do? Why are you in this manufacturing niche? So I'm happy to answer that. Um, as I'm sure some of you know or may have experienced, it can be difficult to prepare to manufacture, to prepare your design for manufacturing or to know exactly what material you should make your product with, what's going to be the most cost effective, when it makes sense to you know, outsource what you're doing or maybe outsource your packaging to someone else and not have all these boxes in your living room anymore. So here at Forge, we've really seen that support on that manufacturing side can make or break an entrepreneur's success, especially when developing a physical product. And in offering this help, we're really able to intervene on critical mistakes around you know, designing for manufacturing or right fit sourcing or preparedness and more. All of these can be um, you know, expensive mistakes to make if you end up going with the wrong manufacturer or you order way too many in the wrong design. So we're really just here to kind of support startups in that journey. Um, another reason we do this work is because despite popular belief, it can actually be less costly for you to work locally as opposed to overseas. I know, I know, sounds crazy, but hear me out. Um, this is especially true when you think about the idea of being able to drive over to your local manufacturing facility, see your product come off the line, communicate live real-time feedback, and many startups don't even realize the capabilities that we have right here in our backyards in Massachusetts and greater New England area. There's actually over 7,000 manufacturers in Massachusetts alone, which is a stat that not that many people know. So. You know, there's definitely advantages to working locally, and we're going to talk all about those in a little while as well. And lastly, it can actually be challenging to reach a startup friendly manufacturer that's willing to work in lower volumes or at a different price point or to scale along with you. And we've seen entrepreneurs waste a lot of time and energy trying to reach someone that, you know, might not even, you might not even be sure has the capability to take on your project at a given time. So we want to make sure that you're not wasting your time cold calling and emailing and we really work to understand uh, what a manufacturer is looking for so when we talk to manufacturers we vet them for exactly what type of companies they're looking to work with and then when we talk to entrepreneurs we try to understand exactly what they need and we try to curate those right fit connections so that nobody's wasting their time on the phone or you know getting five calls in and realizing they're not a great fit to work together um, and so our network really includes manufacturers that are excited about the idea of working with entrepreneurs, diversifying their portfolio, and really just want to be part of bringing game-changing products to market. So we really try to work exclusively with entrepreneurs that are excited or work exclusively with manufacturers that are excited about working with entrepreneurs. So I've seen some chats come through, but I haven't had a chance to read them. Any, should I pause or keep going? I think that they are reinforcing that, yes, it's hard to figure out how to find someone locally. It's hard to order internationally. I mean, I know I've heard many, many entrepreneurs say, oh, well, I need to order a thousand of whatever it is from China and they haven't even prototyped it. So we know that um, these are issues that people have and we're delighted that you're here. And um, if folks want to actually type into the chat what their product is, that might help inform Barb and Anya as we go along. Yeah, that's perfect because my next slide is actually going to be kind of a, a question for the audience about what exactly you guys are working on. So this is a snapshot of what the startups that we work with have, uh, what sectors they've fallen in to date. So you can see consumer products is a pretty big chunk. So is medical devices, um, energy. So yeah, if we could do a little round robin, I think we should have the time and kind of go around and talk about what everyone's working on. I think that would be super helpful for, for the rest of the presentation. So I don't know if any, you guys have a specific order, if anyone just wants to jump in, but go for it. They're all typing it into the chat. Do okay. you want to read them out loud? If you wouldn't mind, uh, that would be great. I just can't super see it with the way I'm screen sharing right now. I can. Um, Kayla is doing pillows from globally sourced handmade textiles. AJ has a 100% recycled leather boat shoe made from cactus leather. Um, 
I'm sorry, you have to tell me how to pronounce your name. I don't want to say it incorrectly. That's okay. Uh, you can call me Suchi. Suchi has a home goods and clothing store. Is it Emily? Muted. Perfect. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, has a stuffed animals store. Uh, the other Emily has kombucha. Kay's has dried uh, CPG dried food. And Heather has a, a bread, a Nordic bread company. Awesome. Cool. Really fun mix of things here. And, you know, we've definitely worked with some textile companies in the past. We've worked specifically with shoe companies. So happy to talk about that. Um, food and beverage. We're going to talk about some great resources for later. So good to know where everyone's coming from. All right. So I started to speak about this a little bit earlier, but I wanted to briefly discuss why manufacturing locally matters and why you should consider having your prototypes made regionally as opposed to just assuming you need to go overseas. So speaking of that, at Forge, we kind of hold this philosophy, um, you know, sort of a secondary mission statement, if you will, that says if you can invent it locally, you should be empowered to make it locally. So not only does sourcing locally contribute to the success of the local economy, it can also actually contribute to the success of your business through offering some unique competitive advantages that we're going to talk about right now. So while it can be tempting to source everything for your startup overseas, it's important to remember that local production is possible and often offers unique competitive advantages and streamlines the product development process. So like I mentioned earlier, the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with your supplier and review design, discuss new strategies, have a front row seat when your first piece comes off the production line. I know that's a super exciting moment and something that you only get to do when your manufacturer is within driving distance. There's also opportunities for strengthened communication, more transparent business relationships, IP and quality protections and elimination of long lead times. I know that's especially been an issue for a lot of the companies we work with, given all the supply chain disruptions lately. Um, and, you know, IP is something that you should take really seriously. And sometimes it can be difficult to communicate, you know, cross-culturally about your ideas um, without making sure that they're secure. So happy to jump into questions around that later if there are any, but just the ability to have more streamlined communication can make a huge difference when it comes to product development. So not only are there opportunities to streamline product development, there can also be cost savings, including costs that you might not think of upfront or that might not be listed you know, on paper. So there can be costs in um, the form of often unexpected tariffs that come up, really, really high shipping fees, especially from what we've seen lately, you know, things stuck on uh, boats coming from Asia for months and cost thousands of dollars, um, and also management overhead associated with working overseas. So these are some of the main reasons that we see startups come our way. Um, startups are often frustrated that their products are taking forever to get here, and that can be the trigger point to meet with us and start thinking about onshoring manufacturing, kind of having that resiliency to your business and knowing that if you need something day of, you can go get it day of and it's not stuck um, in the middle of the Pacific somewhere. Um, of course, this is super top of mind. Um, working locally avoids COVID-19 driven global supply chain disruptions. And these have really been ongoing for over a year and a half now. I think we're all seeing them, especially headed into the holiday season. Things are back ordered. There isn't, you know, inventory in stock. And so, um, definitely an issue that we're all grappling with and something that you can really get ahead of by having some local contacts in your back pocket. And if you need some additional reasons, manufacturing locally contributes to the success of the local economy and reduces carbon footprint from shipping. So especially if you are you know, a sustainably minded brand, which it sounds like a lot of you are, something to think about upfront is you know, reducing your emissions and not having that carbon footprint from the very start. Um, like I mentioned, we have over 400 vetted suppliers in our network, so it's really worthwhile to take advantage of the high quality and trustworthy resources right in our backyards in Massachusetts and the greater New England area. I would say about 90% of our network is based in that region. We have some outliers across the country, but we're really honed in on being hyper-local and especially on domestic work. Um, and this is also required depending on some of the industry that you may be going into. It doesn't sound like anyone on this call is interested in, you know, the defense industry, but that's something to think about, especially, you know, there are incentives to working 
domestically. Uh, President Biden has made working domestically a big priority. So that's something to think about as well. So we've talked a lot about you know, manufacturing support. We have all this manufacturing support. Well, you might be wondering what kind of manufacturing support do you actually have? So we put together this quick slide just to run through some of our most popular asks. So these include plastics and 3D printing, machining, forming and fabricating different metals, electromechanics and computers, testing and certification is a huge one, engineering and design, packaging and third party logistics like shipping and assembly, I definitely should have put textiles on here. That's an ask that we've been getting more and more lately. Um, and so, like I mentioned, the manufacturers in our network are really vetted for wanting to engage with startups and are really excited about innovation. So we are ready to talk to you and offer direct introductions to suppliers with the manufacturing capabilities that you need. And I really wanna emphasize that these are just a handful of examples. So if you don't see a capability on this slide, it doesn't mean that we don't have it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist locally. It just means we've never received it before, but we're happy to do some digging. That's uh, really a benefit to both sides. We love to find out about more manufacturers and we're happy to kind of spare you that time and all those cold calls. So that's a little bit about what we do. And I'm not sure if anyone has any questions at this point or if I've missed anything in the chat, feel free to interrupt me. No, okay, so I will keep on going. And this next slide really just has some examples of specific suppliers in our network that are located in Western Mass. Um, so I'm just gonna run through some of these just so you can see some of the strengths of the region and really how, how much in your backyard um, these capabilities are that people often don't know about. So the first one I'm gonna start with is especially relevant to some of the folks working on food in this call. So it's the Western Massachusetts Food Processing Center located in Greenfield. So this facility offers rental manufacturing space as well as co-packing services to food and beverage businesses. Um, and what's cool about this, um, this supplier is that they actually also offer one-on-one -on -one consoling and technical assistance, supporting you with business planning, product development, regulatory compliance, all of those important things. So I know that we had a startup that came to us with questions about, you know, how do I make my first nutrition label? And so they were a great resource to send them um, for those types of questions. The next one is Carta Mundi. Um, and Carta Mundi is actually a toy manufacturer, like a, a game piece manufacturer. So they're located in East Longmeadow and they were the former uh, manufacturer for all the Hasbro games. So if you think of like Sorry, like all of those things that you roll were produced right in East Longmeadow. And because they, they basically injection mold all of their parts, it's a, it's a plastic process, they're able to take on outside customers as well. So we send a lot of companies their way that need plastic um, help because they have great facilities. The next one is another plastics resource, but actually they also do textiles. So it's called Toner Plastics, but they also have um, a subset of their business called Toner Textiles. They're based in East Longmeadow and they partner closely with Modern Mold and Tool who's also on this list. Um, so they manufacture a ton of different products uh, but one really interesting industry that they intersect with is actually crafts. So making like the little beads that go into jewelry and stuff like that. Uh, but really anything plastic related is up their alley. And like I said, they have a, they have a textiles aspect of their business as well, which I know was really focused on um, helping to make the cloth masks when um, the pandemic was first ramping up and the medical ones were in really short supply. So the next one is CoFab Design. They're based in Holyoke in the super cool building by the water. I don't know Holyoke super well, but I imagine if you guys do, there's like a sort of mill district, historic mill district there in one of those buildings. Um, and they're a really awesome group focused on engineering and design. So they're the type of company that could take your idea or your initial prototype and turn it into a fully functional product. So they're such a powerhouse. I've seen them do this a number of times and we'll have some specific examples later on in the presentation, but CoFab is awesome and local to you. Next one is ShineWire based in Adams. Doesn't sound like anyone on this call is working on anything with an electronic component, but they're a really great resource when it comes to custom cable assemblies or wire harnesses. So basically anything with a little computer or an electronic component to it, they're a great resource. Um, the next one on here is Boyd Technologies, which is based in Lee and they specialize in manufacturing essentially single use products. So mostly in the medical space, but not always. So in the past, they've been the manufacturer for 
Clorox ready mops, as well as uh, the Johnson and Johnson hurt free tape. So like medical tape, um, Oral-B toothbrushes. So things that need to be made and typically like sterilized and packaged, uh, they're a great place to go for that. And last but not least on this list, we have the UMass AdFab Lab, which stands for the Additive Fabrication Laboratory. And they really focus on 3D printing out of the UMass Amherst campus. And what's great to know about the AdFab is that they not only do work with outside companies outside of the university, there's actually an awesome state subsidy program that can get startups with less than 10 employees up to 70% off of their services. So it becomes super affordable to do any sort of engineering or design or 3D printing work with them. And um, yeah, they're an awesome resource and people don't take advantage. So we love to spread the, the good word about everything that the AdFab Lab does. So those are really just some examples of the breadth of the Massachusetts manufacturing ecosystem and the Forge network. But I'm gonna hand it over to Barb to kind of zoom out, talk in more general terms about what exactly a manufacturing company is and what working with one might look like for you. So. Anya, let me just ask a clarifying question. So you've given us some um, leads here. And, and of course, at, at EFRO, we know a fair number of these folks. Are they better off going through Forge with that introduction or should someone call Stephen Boyd? That's a great question. So um, what's really beneficial about going through Forge is you know, we have this network of 450 manufacturers, right? So if you come to us with a discrete need, we'll typically have multiple recommendations for you. And so we'll be able to send you multiple referrals and you can kind of go through the quoting process, figure out who you have the most rapport with. And also just getting a warm introduction makes a huge difference. So us kind of getting you on an email chain with our main point of contact there really gets you a quick response and ensures that you're able to connect with the company quickly as opposed to just kind of submitting an email inquiry or that kind of thing. Um, so I, I would say the main benefits of going through Forge is that we're able to connect you with multiple options for whatever you're looking for and also that we can really provide that warm curated intro. And if I can add one more thing to that, mm -hmm. Anya, please, which is um, there's always nuances to products. So even um, uh, one of these providers might look like the right thing for your business. There may be some nuances of what you're doing where they're not the best fit and somebody else is. So that's why we were talking about kind of best fit. We take a lot of information from all the companies we work with. Yeah, that's a great point. So we really try to understand, you know, not only exactly what they do as far as capabilities, but also, you know, what are their lead times? What are their minimum contract values? What, um, you know, manufacturing readiness do they want to work with when it comes to startups. And so we really try to get a whole cohesive, holistic picture to make sure you're getting sent to all the right places. So yeah, any other questions before I move on to the next slide? Um, I see that there's a question about Eastern Massachusetts. And the answer is, of course, when this email, when this webinar got set up, they saw Deborah Gallant from Berkshire County. So they've made it a more Western Massachusetts focus here, but they cover the whole state of Massachusetts. And if you're outside of Massachusetts, you can certainly call them and see if they can still help you. So um, I'm going to let Barb take it from here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I can speak to that really quick too. So we can work with startups regardless of where they're based. We've actually, I worked with two international startups this week. So as long as you know that most of our network is in the Massachusetts and greater New England area, we're happy to work with really anyone. But yeah, sorry, Barb, didn't mean to interrupt. Yep, nope, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Anya's gonna drive the slide. So there we go, next slide. So like Anya said, now we just kind of want to make sure that the language is understood because I think this will, help you when you are describing your needs. So uh, when we actually say we have a supplier network, we're talking about a whole bunch of different kinds of companies that each play a part uh, in what you might call manufacturing or production. And it's kind of a broad term, but it's anybody that um, you know can design a product, manufacture all of it, manufacture part of it, make a special part for you, uh, any of, of those permutations and combinations. So. You know, here's some examples. The, the green device, if anybody's not colorblind, is what's called an overmolding device. So it's metal and two kinds of plastic. So you can imagine that being on the end of something. Uh, the red baby bottle looking thing is a combination of what's called injection molding and blow molding. Um, and, you know, again, when it comes together, it ends up being a special kind of bottle. That fan like thing in the lower 
left. I'm sure you guys have heard of 3D printing. It's hard to not hear about that in the news these days. It used to be called additive manufacturing, but it's a special kind of a process where it's like layers are built up to actually make a 3D structure. So those little fan things are actually 3D printed. Um, I saw the clothing thing. I, we will get to some of those, believe me, we will. Um, uh, there's other things like the whack, uh, the white um, like switch is probably, I don't actually know who made that, but it's probably what's called vacuum former injection molding. Uh, the cables are called the cable harness so if you're doing electronics. So, and then um, Anya was mentioning things like electronic boards. If you look in the upper left picture, that little green thing, if no one's seen what a computer board looks like on the inside, that's kind of the breadboard. So uh, there are manufacturers and supply chain people uh, that um, contribute to everything that we're doing. That phone booth that's sitting there is actually the brand of a uh, phone booth called Bento that Greentown Labs has in their facility. Um, and they uh, manufactured, uh, they do manufacture those. And I think that they did a slightly special design for Greentown, but that is um, a product that's actually um, a number of products that are put together and then they fabricate um, the, the container, if you will, that's around it. So if you look inside, you'll see that there's a little wall outlet that's actually an electrical outlet. They don't make the wall outlet. They buy that from one of these other companies on this sheet and then integrate that into what their specialty is, which is fabricating these beautiful, you know, shells, which I think they're wood, right, Anya? Are they yes. wood? Yeah. I was sitting in one last week, but I forgot to pay attention. Uh, you know, and they've got the shelf and everything on it. So that's somebody that's, that's um, su getting supplier parts from other companies and fabricating their own and then uh, putting it all together, you know, integrating it into an actual produced finished product. So there are people in all of those kinds of spaces. Um, next, Anya, please. So it also includes anybody that needs to certify a product. And these are also part of um, our suppliers. So Anya mentioned it briefly, but if you're doing anything with food, remember you have to have one of these labels in order for it to, to pass FDA. If, you're, if you have your own bakery, you don't need to do this labeling. Hopefully, if you want to keep your customers, uh, you're aware of cross contaminations and things like that. But if you're doing anything for any kind of volume manufacturing and distribution, uh, like you're going to ship it to bakeries in the region in some sort of a sealed box or container, you need to have these kind of uh, labels on it. If you're doing anything with electronics, I'm sure anyone who's turned over any kind of a plug from your phone or your computer, you've seen these UL labels and CSA labels and all of that. So those are tests for the electronics to make sure that you won't get zapped. <laughs> and um, there are companies that do the, the testing discreetly, meaning that that's all they do and they'll make sure the products pass all of this. And then as well, many of the companies we work with as part of their integrated manufacturing, one of their steps is doing this testing. So depending on which part of that you need, um, you know, that can be involved. Um, this picture of the, of the little kid uh, chewing on, I think it's a Lego part, there are also testing labs. So anyone who's gonna end up doing children's products, um, there are testing labs uh, to make sure that the parts aren't too small to be swallowed. There's also fabric testing labs because uh, uh, products for children have to have certain fire regulations. So again, this is why we said there's nuances to what, what people might ask us for, for us to make sure that the um, company that, that the supplier we're matching you with has the capability that you need. And Anya briefly mentioned, uh, if you happen to be selling to the military, and there are certainly uh, fabric products that are sold to the military, so who knows? I don't think that falls under ITAR though, but ITAR basically has to do with not giving away secrets that the US doesn't wanna give away. So if you wanna work with the government for that, uh, you have to uh, have ITAR compliance. Okay, next one, please. Uh, so I think um, most of you are not doing what's on the left, but I'll mention it. So if you were to do anything that was related to software, there are firms called product design firms, and there are actually specialty firms called user interface or usability experts, that if you wanted to do a software, they actually work with you to make sure that the flow 
uh, is user friendly. And I'm sure some of us have used electronic and computer products where we found that that was not the case. Um, it's much better for your products if you can really get the flow right and make them really easy to use. So there so, are companies that So Barb, ones. let me just ask a question because you brought up a lot of things that I think people maybe haven't thought all the way through when they think yeah. about manufacturing clothes or shoes or food or whatever. If if you don't have any idea who these certification firms are or what you need, th this is what Forge is really a resource for, is to help you understand what the checklist is that your organization might have that you may just be oblivious to because you never did this before. Hey, thank you, Deborah. We need to put you on our team. Yes, that's very <laughs> true. And what's probably even more true is when we hook you up with the right kind of supplier, they know the real questions to ask. So we can ask it at one layer, they're gonna dig down even further. And when we said that we only in our network have startup friendly suppliers, it's not just about volume. And volume certainly is something that some you know, companies won't work with low volumes or short runs because then there's a change right after you make 10 of them. But also we we're working with companies who understand that your area of expertise may be in making delicious cookies, cupcakes, or brilliantly beautiful shoes, but that you're not a manufacturing expert. And so they know the questions to ask. Um, and so that's what we mean by, you know, we're vetting the supply chain and connecting with people who will sit down with you and have the patience, quite frankly, uh, to work with somebody who's not an expert in the entire process. And that's really where, you know, look, at you have to be a very large company before you have experts in the entire process, you know. So, you know, it's just normal for a startup to not actually have that expertise in, in several places. And so we're trying to find companies that will sit down and patiently say, here's a place you have to make a decision. How is this going to be used? You know, all of that sort of stuff. Is that good, Deborah? Cool. <laughs> Um, so on the uh, right is a company and happens to be an example of one of the product design firms, Bayard Design, that we work with. And um, it sounds like this might apply to some of you, but their whole thing, when we talk about a product design firm, or even a, sometimes it's called a packaging firm, which can uh, have a couple of meanings. But for product design firms, it's the people who make those beautiful cases that are on our iPhones or on our Androids or the beautiful speakers that you see in that little bottom you know, picture there. So their whole thing is making things kind of look gorgeous and the insides have to work really well and be user-friendly and all that too. But the extra special sauce for them is that you know, they're making uh, beautiful to, to look at products. Um, so you know, that's kind of what product design firms you know, end up doing for you. In a lot of cases, some of you are gonna need um, somebody that can do what's called computer-aided design. And that is actually figuring out how to either electro or mechanically something needs to fit together. Um, even I can even imagine with shoes, I know one of you mentioned shoes that, uh, the, you know, the way the tops have to fit the lasts and the way the laces have to go in the holes and all that sort of stuff requires some sort of design so that they can, if you're going to manufacture and not hand tool them, that you can actually uh, produce them repeatedly, right? Because you do want kind of usually Unless you're doing something on purpose where you want them to be different, usually you want quality control where they're kind of the same, mostly kind of 99%. <laughs> um, Anya also mentioned this, and this could be applicable to some of you. So IP protection means intellectual property protection. And I'm sure everybody has heard the word patent, but that's basically what in general that's related to is if you have something that's so unique, that's a process or has some um, special, I'm going to use special sauce as sort of a generic term, right? There's something special about it that nobody's ever done before. You could possibly uh, stop other people um, from infringing on that thing that you've invented. And so if anybody has something that they think is along those lines, we're happy to explore that more. Another area of intellectual property happens to be um, copyright. And another one is trademark. So uh, if you look at that Bayard design, if you can kind of see their logo and stuff, that's probably trademarked because it's got all sorts of design characteristics to their name, the font and the logo and all of that. And, and you know, you think of things like Coca-Cola, that Coca-Cola script, that's actually trademarked. So depending on how important these things are for your brand, you know, the font, the colors, the treatment, all those styles, that's also part of intellectual property. And it might be important to you. Um, if you're doing a fashion kind of a thing, 
it could very well be. I, I use the example that, um, you know, Liz Claiborne is a real person and she named her, her company Liz Claiborne, which then became a trademark, which means that she can, she's not with the company anymore. She can no longer use that name for the name of a company. Yeah, she can use it for her own human name, but she can't start another company. So be careful when you name something after yourself. <laughs> Uh, so I think that's it. And the bottom picture is um, showing a, a production line. So there's a difference between manufacturing, which is kind of making and uh, even using maybe robots to assemble things versus uh, produce something which tends to be a little less complex. So if you think about that Coca-Cola bottle, and you've probably seen pictures of machines that fill it with the soda and stuff like that, that's production versus manufacturing. It's a little bit different, but uh, um, so it depends on what you're doing. If you need to stuff packages, it's kind of production. And if you need to put things together, it's more manufacturing, just, just to help with some language. This is part of what we help, you know, people understand and, and speak with correctly. Um, I think next, um, uh, yeah, sorry, I just have to take a sip of water. No worries. I think the next slide uh, loops back to me. But before we move on there, I will also say, you know, what Barb was saying about Coca-Cola reminded me that Coca-Cola's recipe is actually not IP protected. It's actually a trade secret. So if you want to talk to a lawyer about if you are supposed to patent something or if you, it would be better to keep it a trade secret, that's something we can help with. Um, and yeah, special combinations of CBD and certain products and, you know, stuff like that. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So the next couple of slides are going to run us through some examples of startups that we have worked with. I know it's a, it's a lot of information. So we always find that talking about our work in terms of real life success stories, real companies that have worked with manufacturers in Massachusetts and have been successful is always a good uh, you know, grounding point. So I will go ahead and jump in with this first one, which is Quickcord. So Quickcord is a company founded out of East Longmeadow by two Marine veterans. And in their service, they identified a problem. Um, so for military men and women, simple equipment can be major factors in determining whether an operation is a success or a failure. And one example is paracord. So you might've seen paracord before, you know, extremely high tensile strength cord carried by military members and outdoorsmen and used you know, as a temporary fix for essentially anything in a tactical or an emergency situation. But paracords have suffered from major performance issues. And this was something that the co-founders of Quickcord experienced. It's actually funny, they're both named Matt, which is very confusing, but the Matt's experienced an issue. And it was that there was really no easy way to carry the long length of cord and it would tangle really easily and it wouldn't be reliable when you needed it, which is the whole point of you know, carrying this item. So. They designed the quick cord product, which you can see in the picture on the top right there. So it's a handheld utility device to carry, cut, and deploy paracord in the most efficient way possible. It's a six inch kind of canister-like device that stores and dispenses paracord without ever allowing it to tangle. And it's really lightweight and carries up to 25 feet of cord. And they actually did choose to patent the uh, stacking method within the device to disp dispense cord as easily as possible. It also has some other features that aren't as obvious just when you're looking at it. There's a smart blade inside of it to ensure precise and safe cutting. And there's actually a nighttime signaling device called a buzz saw that can provide 12 hours of uninterrupted signal in an emergency situation. So it's meant for both civilian and military use. And it's really a game changer for anyone that uses paracord. And we always like to tell this story because when Quickcord came to Forge a couple of years ago, they literally came with a toilet paper roll covered in duct tape and said, this is what it's gonna look like. And that was their prototype. Um, so they didn't know much, but they did know one thing. And it was that their big priority was that they wanted to make sure the product was made in the local community, as opposed to being shipped overseas. You know, I mentioned, this is a military product. This is something they need to make domestically, but they really chose to prioritize making it in the local Massachusetts community. So that's exactly what we helped them do. We help them connect with six different suppliers in our network from everything from design to plastic molding, even assembly. And now Quickcord is proud to say that their product is fully manufactured in the Pioneer Valley. So I'll move on to the next story if there's any questions. Cool. 
So the next story is Paliv. So when we first started working with Paliv, I was shocked to find out that almost 10 million people misused prescription pain relievers in the United States in 2019. So the co-founders decided to start Paliv after realizing the devastating effects of the opioid crisis affecting the US. And they were influenced by not only the magnitude of the problem, but they also experienced it firsthand and knew what kind of tools were needed to solve it. So you can see their product on the screen here. It's kind of that plastic attachment that attaches to a prescription pill bottle. And it's an end-to-end -end monitoring device that connects to a mobile application and it documents pain levels and dispenses medication as needed. Um, it also monitors tampering or unauthorized entry, alerting both Paliv as a company and also the patient's physician so it provides the device to the patient to monitor usage and also screen for any aberrant behaviors. Um, and then it safely transmits that data to authorized health healthcare providers and the necessary stakeholders so that they can take action early on. So by detecting the signs of addiction earlier, intervening and ensuring patients are using their prescriptions safely, Paliv decreases the social and financial burden that cripples patients, doctors, insurance agencies, loved ones um, with this issue. So. Forge approached, Paliv approached Forge um, with several discrete manufacturing challenges in May of last year. And the first connection that we sent them to is called Four Star Connections, which is a cable assembly shop with immense design experience based in Hudson, Mass. And they actually worked together to create those printed circuit boards. So those little green things that Barb pointed to earlier, Believe it or not, this little device has a pretty powerful computer in it. And so they worked together to create about 300 boards together. And Believe also participated in a Forge signature event called a Rocket Roundtable. So essentially, we bring together a panel of manufacturers and a panel of startups to kind of talk about their supply chain challenges and their manufacturing challenges. And they were able to leave with some immediate connections and some next steps um, for their for their challenges. So if any of you would like to participate in one of those, we're always recruiting for future events. So definitely feel free to shoot me an email. But with the rise, especially of telehealth during the pandemic, Forge has been really proud to support Paliv and we're looking forward to seeing all the amazing things that they do, especially considering that you might not always wanna to go to the doctor. So it's a great solution. All right, I'll move on to the next example here, which is 1854 Cycling. So 1854 is a super unique startup. They're based in Framingham and they are a premium bicycle, e-bike, so electric bicycle and apparel company that was really established to provide meaningful work and a living wage to the formerly incarcerated, especially women. So they have a big emphasis on training and employing the formerly incarcerated to help build service and program their electric bikes, which you can see here. And they hope by doing this that they can break the cycles of poverty and recidivism. So a really fun fact and a really cool fact is that the name 1854 Cycling originates from local Massachusetts history. So um, on July 4th, 1854, the Anti-Slavery Society met in Framingham to protest the hypocrisy of celebrating America's independence while participating in the practice of slavery. So super tied to their Massachusetts roots and they are still based in Framingham. They have a production facility there now. And you can see on the top, that's their flagship police bike, which uses its technology to unite law enforcement with the communities that they're serving. So it has a tablet installed on the bicycle and that allows access to data on homeless shelters, communications with health providers and student data for you know college campus patrols, things like that. So 1854 first came to Forge in 2019 and we were able to connect them with Exor, which is a pretty uh, large manufacturer, but they have a branch here in Massachusetts and they are a distributor of touch base displays, touch screen displays. Um, and so they were able to develop and produce the touch screen console um, and they're also really prioritizing U.S. manufacturing um, in general. So 85% of their manufacturing and sourcing is domestic, which we love to see. And they've really become more than just a premium bicycle and apparel brand. They've really become a symbol of the movement to end generational poverty among formerly incarcerated people. So we love that there is a social impact aspect to the work that they're doing as well. And I will move on to our Last but not least success story, which is Freight Farms. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have seen Freight Farms out in the wild. I know that there's one at Clark University. There's actually one just down the street from me. 
And so what they make are these kind of large shipping containers that you can see on the bottom there. Um, it's a climate controlled vertical hydroponic farm within a custom built shipping container. So it's modular and scalable and it makes it possible to grow food anywhere in the world regardless of the climate, which really promotes equitable access to fresh produce, which is a huge issue if you look at food deserts in inner cities. So um, these hydroponic farms tip fit in a typical 320 square feet of a shipping container and they use LED lights and water, but they don't require any sun or soil to grow their fresh produce. And their main customer base is small business owners, corporations, nonprofit organizations, schools, municipalities. The one down the street from me is at an elementary school. So they're kind of able to use it as a tool to teach children about where food comes from, which I think is awesome. So Freight Farm initially came to Forge in, I believe it was 2018 because they needed a new contract manufacturer. And you might be wondering what a contract manufacturer is. And it's sort of what Barb alluded to in that it is really an end-to-end -end solution. So once you've really you know, reached a mature manufacturing um, you know, phase, it's, it's a point where they can kind of take an end-to-end -end solution and fully source everything and assemble it and ship it on your behalf. Um, and so they needed to find someone to build these things because look at them, they're humongous and also to help them with their design for international markets. And so they were transferring from just selling in the US to selling internationally. There were lots of things that they needed to consider in that process. You know, Even if you just think about how there's different outlets in different countries, there's different power, there's different sizes. So um, Ford was able to connect them with Kalo Technologies, which is a manufacturer based in Rutland, Vermont, um, to help assist them in building this new international product. Um, so now they're in over 28 countries worldwide, which is super cool. And um, these are really just a ex few examples of the awesome stories of the entrepreneurs we get to work with. We have tons more on our site if you want to go check them out. Um, and if there are any questions on these, happy to answer them. If not, I'll hand it over to Barb to talk a little more about some of the ways uh, Forge supports startups directly and our impact and how to get involved and all those good things. Well, I think they're cool too. <laughs> cool, Anya. We only have a few more slides. So if you could advance to the next one, please. Um, so uh, just to, to round out some of the other services that uh, Forge provides. So uh, Anya mentioned the weekly product development sessions uh, so that uh, we can uh, try to help understand more of what our startups need and make those right matches. We also have some fun things, which are also educational. They're factory tours. and and sometimes these tours will give you ideas about how things can be made. Um, also uh, let you see some of the companies we might connect you with so you can see what they do and get a better handle on how it might end up serving you. We do a lot of educational and training events. So kind of like what we're doing here tonight, but sometimes we'll do deep dives into any of these things. We mentioned intellectual property. Uh, we can do one on materials. There's all sorts of things like that. And um, you know, based on popular demand, we can always find an expert to do something like a lunch and learn or something like that. Um, we have an annual ma manufacturing and innovation showcase. Um, Anya can probably say a little bit more about that, uh, but I'll just skip to the other two. So uh, we have supplier and investor office hours, meaning that the uh, suppliers or an investor will come in and take one-on-one uh, -on -one or one-on-one -on -one company meetings. Um, and we uh, have uh, hooks into also grant opportunities. Uh, Anya, can you talk about the manufacturing and innovation showcase for a sec? Yeah, definitely. So every year we have kind of a big annual event where we like to bring together all of our uh, startups and all of our suppliers to network and get to know each other. So it's sort of expo style where the manufacturers all have booths. You can go around and visit them, figure out what their capabilities are, chat, exchange business cards. And then there's can I, also- Can I ask, yeah. are, we, are we virtual or are we back in person? So this year it was in person. It's just on an annual basis. So the next one won't be until 2022, but we're hoping we can also hold it in person in 2022. It was actually at Polar Park in Worcester. So the new ballpark. So it was super fun. Hopefully we're able to do it in person again. Um, and there's also a startup pitch aspect to it. So we have a pitch competition where we give out non-dilutive uh, product development funding. So we were able to give out let me think, I believe it was $20,000 or $25,000 total um, this past year. So definitely subscribe to our newsletter, keep an eye out for when we're starting to recruit for next year. Um, but yeah, are you ready for the, the next slide, Barb? 
I just want to say one thing. I don't know if any of you have been factory tour geeks, but when I was a kid, my Girl Scout troop went for a tour of the Peter Paul and Mounds factory and the Wonder Bread factory as different like field trips. I don't know what the Girl Scout leader was thinking, but I want to say they were formative in how I thought about work and business. It was so cool. If you have opportunities to go see things being made, it's so inspiring. Yeah, the, the Budweiser uh, factory up in New Hampshire, right? And you, you get a beer at the end of it. <laughs> oh, Ben and Jerry's, you get ice cream. Okay, yeah, I'm true. sorry, I, I interrupted. That's okay. Uh, go, go ahead, please, Anya. <laughs> so I just wanted to, to plant some seeds on this. Um, most of the companies we work with are at what's called a manufacturing readiness level, MRL4. So um, just to be clear, and that's why one of the questions that came up about can you make an introduction to a supplier? So remember we said there's best fit matches, that's on both sides. So our suppliers very often cannot work just off of a napkin, napkin sketch. There has to be a little bit more put into it. If you're developing a drink, you have to kind of have the formula worked out right there. Typically not there to work that out for you, what you want it to taste like. Um, so, you know, even if it's something more complex, so we, you know, try to encourage you to get further along to you're at the point that you can kind of at least show them something, even if you've made it out of plastic or wood or paper, um, or if it's an electronic, have something that looks ugly, but kind of sort of works and start from that perspective. Um, and um, so that's called an MRL4. And so we uh, try to assess that startups are at least that far along. Um, next slide, please, Anya. There's other qualifications too, but go ahead. So uh, one of the reasons that uh, Forge is so successful, so you see we've had over 400 startups that we've supported, but um, I think um, more impressive is that most of the startups we've worked with, over 90% of them actually has survived. And part of that is part of this process of making sure that we're working with a company that's ready to actually go to the next step. Um, we have a 75% return rate. So what does that mean? That means that a, a startup that works with us once will probably come back to work with us again as their product develops, right? In the beginning, they need one thing. And then as they advance, they need another thing. Sometimes they need two or three different things all at the same time. Uh, so we have a very high return rate, which is a good thing. Um, and then we're very proud also of, uh, of supporting minority led businesses. And that's uh, at 40% at this point in time. Yeah, we're almost done with the formal presentation. Next slide, please, Anya. We timed it pretty well. We shouldn't be really over. So I just wanted to show you the team, um, most especially uh, show you Kevin Maforte, who had, for whoever hasn't met him, he is actually your uh, star interface for the um, Metro West, or not the Metro West. If the you're West in Western State. Massachusetts, remember, this is, this is for people all across the E4L network. So there are people in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, in New York. So it may not be that Kevin is your guy, but there's always a point of entry. For just That's right. So it's, it's probably going to be Kevin or me. And if not, it will probably be um, Will or Anya from the startup perspective. Um, and there's a form on our website and we'll be we'll put up the URL for you where you can reach out and then we reach back to set up a meeting with you. And next slide, please. And Laura Teicher, by the way, is on the phone call. I just saw our fearless leader. Um, so the weekly product development sessions are with Anya every Wednesday. Uh, that's actually a live link and we can put them in the uh, ch chat as well. There's Kevin's contact information, Anya's contact information and our main website. And uh, I think that that's it other than our next, do you have any questions slide? All right, so what I'm going to ask you to do is you can stop sharing and Allison can stop the recording. And um, I want to thank um, our, you guys were amazing. Um, the presentation, I, when I saw this first, I was like, wow, this is all available for free, which is just astonishing. But I know that some of these individual entrepreneurs have questions that they want to ask about their business and their product and what they've heard from people who say you have to do X, you have to do Y, you have to do Z, and whether any of that is true. So Allison, can you confirm we have stopped recording? Okay. Who has